Welcome to The Coaching Cast, your working from home managers club, here to check in with you weekly to share your working highs and lows, remind you that you're not alone and that there's many of us outside of your current four walls all trying to be the best coach, leader and manager we can be. I'm Susie, sales and business coach at Future You Business Coaching, currently taking on my hardest coaching assignment to date, parenting a toddler who doesn't take too kindly to being questioned. And I'm Lisa, founder of Grip Corporate Coaching, personal performance coach, leader and chief eye roller when it comes to all nonsensical corporate mumbo jumbo which suffocates rather than advocates. In this podcast, we aim to explore the leadership and coaching techniques required to navigate and survive the current business environment. Presenting different topics each episode, which we will discuss with some very special guests along the way, sharing ideas, hints and tips for you to take away and try for yourself. Today's episode features Zuby, independent rapper, podcast host, author, public speaker and creative entrepreneur. There was so much incredible content given by Zuby that we have chosen to dedicate the full episode time to our conversation with him. And so there is no listener question or bullshit bingo in this week's episode. We hope you enjoy listening. Our special guest today is Zuby, a musician, author, podcaster, public speaker, fitness expert, and life coach. There are many strands to his business empire. But Zuby is more than just a rapper. He is a rising public figure, an influential voice and business owner, whose unique perspective, authenticity, and positive energy has earned him over 700,000 followers on social media and 10 million plus online video views. He has caught the attention of some of the most popular media personalities in the world, appearing on the Joe Rogan Experience, the Adam Carolla Show, and on mainstream outlets such as BBC and Sky News. Zuby was born in England and raised in Saudi Arabia, where he attended an international school. And while studying computer science at Oxford Uni, he started rapping and within months self-released his first album, Commercial Underground. Since then, he's created his own successful merchandise line, reached number 12 on the iTunes hip hop chart and self-released five albums and three EPs on his own label. Zuby's fan base and business achievements continue to grow rapidly. He is now the highest funded UK based rapper on Kickstarter. His podcast, Real Talk with Zuby, reaches thousands of listeners every week. And his first book, Strong Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody, has sold over 4,000 copies independently. In his own words, business success comes from offering something that people value to the specific people who value it. Supporters and customers are the lifeblood of any venture. Zuby, welcome to the coaching cast. We are really excited and slightly in awe to talk to you today. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Susie. I appreciate that. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, and yeah, we are big fans of uh, what you do and how you've built your, your empire to this point. And we're really excited to talk to you about that today. Um, so we're going to focus our discussion with you around the subject of entrepreneurship and what your experiences and lessons have been in building your brand and business over the last decade or so. Uh, there's so much to talk about. So with that in mind, could you start by firstly just outlining your current business setup for our listeners? Yeah, sure thing. So with me, everything started out just with music. So as you mentioned, when I was in university, uh, still in my teenage years, in fact, I put out my first album and that was my first, it wasn't my first entrepreneurial venture, but that was my first music project. Anyone who uh, went to school with me knows that I was always selling stuff in school. I've always been a hustler. I grew up in Saudi Arabia and of course I was back and forth between Saudi and the UK. So I was running some sort of import export business. I was selling shoes. I was selling watches. Uh, I was selling cigarettes. Um, <laughs> so I, I've always been a guy who sells stuff. I was even selling candy and chocolate and stuff like that. Wow. So I've always been entrepreneurial. And 
I started rapping just as a hobby. It began as just something I was doing for fraud, for, for fun, sorry. And then when I released my first album, that was when the spark went off as, oh, wow, okay, this is something I can earn money from. People are willing to pay me for my CDs and for my live performances, et cetera. So it really built up from there. Now, many, many years later, really 15 years on from that first album release, there are various branches to what I do. So of course, I've got my music and everything linked with that. So recorded music, live music, I've got a very big merchandise brand, um, which I sell both primarily now online, but I've also in the past done pop-up shops. I did that from 2014 to 2018 when I was traveling all over the UK in various shopping centers. Now it's more online based. So I've got the music aspect. And then of course, I've got my podcast, which I started in 2019, Real Talk with Zuby. Um, as we record this episode, I think I've done about 160 episodes so far. So okay. there's the the podcast avenue. And I also appear on lots of other people's podcasts. I've done some TV stuff, uh, Sky News, Fox News, BBC, etc. And then I also do public speaking. So that's a smaller channel, but um, I've got some big opportunities c coming up with that. And I've, I've done some, some really interesting events. And then I also do coaching as well. So I do different forms of coaching. I do life coaching. I do social media coaching and I do fitness coaching. And then of course I've got my book. Uh, my first <laughs> book I put out there, Strong Advice. It's not going to be my last book, but I put a, I put that out there initially just as an ebook. Um, I thought it would just sell a couple hundred copies and I'd help a few people get some gains or losses in the gym, depending on what they're trying to do. And then the demand just kept going. People started asking if there was an audiobook available. So when I was in Nashville, I went to a studio and I recorded the audiobook version. I narrated it myself. And then people start as started asking for physical copies. So I've now done eight runs of paperback copies. They they always sell very quickly. It's it's been a big success. I've had a lot of DMs and messages and emails, people telling me all of their achievements. It's got over 200 five-star reviews and lots of written reviews. And the book has really helped a lot of people. It's been sold in, I know I've shipped paperbacks to 60 different, 62 different countries now. Okay. Which pretty, wow. Which is pretty insane. And um, it's also an evergreen book. So it's not something that's just going to sell for now. It's something that 10 years from now on, I can still be promoting and selling it because the basics of nutrition and fitness and mindset and motivation don't change every year. Yeah. So um, I, I wish I wrote it a long time ago, but I'm glad I did when I did. I don't, well, think, I don't think you're busy enough. I know. I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, how, how, how on earth do you feel this in? There's only one of you, unless there's, uh, well, unless there's like, you've got clones, but that is incredible. What a, yeah. what a repertoire. I'm literally yeah. like, oh my word. Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. That's, uh, that's uh, um, admirable in itself. Goodness Thank me. You. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of work. I'm not going to I'm not going to front. I do probably if I were to break down my jobs, I'd probably do the jobs of like 15 to 20 people in some way, shape or form from web website designer to to graphic design to all the all the actual stuff I'm supposed to do. But there's yeah. a lot of different aspects to it. Yeah. How do you keep yourself motivated with with such a wide variety of, of different strands to your business? And I suppose each one of those probably requires you to do different things. How do you how do you keep yourself focused and, and motivated on on doing that? Mm, because I know exactly why I'm doing it. OK. Yeah. And I don't do anything that I don't want to. Okay. So I love what I do. Every single branch of that thing. I love I love music. I love podcasting. I love public speaking. I love coaching people and helping people to achieve their goals. I love creating hats and t-shirts and bits of merchandise and stuff. So I genuinely love it. The only stuff I don't like is some of the administrative stuff that just comes with running a business. But in terms of the creative stuff and what I'm promoting and what I'm actually selling, not only did I create it, but I believe in it and I know that it has a positive impact on people. And my big goal is to have a very, my goal is to have a positive impact on over 10 million people in this world before I die. Um, I might need to up that number again soon, but that's my goal. So everything I do, every piece of content I put out is all in line with that goal. If it doesn't line up with that goal, then I won't do it. Yeah. I love that, that you've got such a clear goal that's kind of anchored in what you then move forward with and how you progress. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, really important. So, um, 
I'm going to take it back a little bit because I'm going to take you back to your first love, which I know is the music, which you've you've already said, you know, is the foundation of a lot of what you then have gone on to do and, mm. and achieve. So let's take it back a little bit more to where it all began in 2006 and that first album, Commercial Underground. Tell us a little bit more around um, how that album came about. Okay. So I started rapping, like I said, just as a hobby. I'd been a hip hop fan for quite a while, all through my teenage years. My friends and I were banging out way too much music and buying way too much music, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, how we, that's how we made it through. Uh, I went to boarding school. That's how we made it through. And then uh, when I was in my first year of university, I actually wrote my first lyrics when I was traveling. So I was going from the UK to Nigeria. I got stuck in Paris for about 24 hours. I was by myself. I was bored had my MP3 player, had a notepad, and I just started writing down some lyrics just out of interest, out of boredom. And it came to me fairly naturally. Like I'd never written a rap before, but given that I was like, oh, okay, this is something I can actually do. So I kept on doing it and I would record um, just into my phone, just record acapella recordings, play them to friends, family, whatever. I got back to university. One of my friends had a very basic recording setup in his dorm room. Um, and he yeah. had some technical know-how. So I would download beats off the internet and I would just go and I started recording songs with him. First song I made was called The Bad Man. Then I made one called Oh No. And then I made one called um, Tonight. So those were like my first three songs. I put them up online and started getting mostly positive feedback. Of course, not all positive, um, as we all know. But yeah, so that was something I kept doing. And then after about nine or 10 months, I had enough songs recorded to put a little project together. So my first album was, it was just eight songs. So it was kind of like a halfway between an EP and a, and a full length album. And I just looked up, okay, how do I, how can I get some CDs made? So I looked that up and I just started out with 50 copies. So I made 50 copies. I went to my friends and family who had been, you know, enjoying my music thus far. And I sold all 50 copies in a few days. And then I took that money and I went back and I made uh, I don't know, 200, 250 copies. And then I went out a little bit wider and I sold all of those. And then I took that money. I made more. I think I made a thousand at that point. And then I started getting to the stage where I would be out and about in uh, primarily I started out in Oxford on Cord Market Street to anyone who's familiar with the city, just talking to strangers, playing them my music, um, going around. Anyone who was around at this time would know that I was quite a common sight in the city. I'd be there with my backpack and my Zuby t-shirt, just talking to people all, all day long, like every Saturday, every Sunday, I was just out there. And then eventually I started going to London. I was selling my CDs in Leicester Square. Eventually I started going all over the UK eventually. And that's really how I put my name on the map, it was more in the real world than it was online. Like these days, most people know me from online stuff, but it yeah. really, it really started out in the physical world. Of course, I started doing live performances and gigs and, and, and that as well, just doing what I could to get my, get my name out there. Even with the t-shirts, the first ever, um, I'm down with Zuby t-shirt. I don't sell them anymore, but I had those t-shirts for like a decade. Uh, I mean, I just made one for myself to begin with. And then my friends at university were like, yo, that's a dope t-shirt. I want one. <laughs> so I came back and I had like 15 made for some of my best friends. So, so it got to the stage where just tons of people in uni were going around with these t-shirts. <laughs> I'm down, I'm down with Zuby. Are you? That's what's on the t-shirt, yeah. right? And it Love just, it. it just became a thing, right? The girls wanted one. So I, <laughs> so I started making like female sizes and it just became a thing. Just black t-shirts, white text. I'm down with Zuby. Are you? Amazing. And um, yeah, that was kind of my initial branding. It wasn't something I massively contrived. It just came and it worked and it, you know, pe people liked it. So it was that plus the music. And then of course, over time, things, things grew from there. Yeah. I actually had a, I'm down with Zuby. Are you? There hoodie? we go. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was black. Amazing. I feel like I'm missing out. <laughs> Um, cause Zuby and I have known each other, um, a while and I've been to see you in concert a number of times. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's brilliant to see your kind of journey, um, unfold and how the music has, um, I suppose was the starting point, but how it's really then led into other kind of creative, uh, avenues for you. Um, and so I know the music then built from further 
from that first album. Um, so aside from that, how did, tell us a little bit more about how the other strands of your business came about. So, you know, the podcast, the book, the merchandise, um, how did that come, come about? Yeah, sure. So to talk a little bit about the interim period, just so people know. So after I graduated, I did my music full time for one year but I had a job offer already to work in London. So in that uh, one year period, I released my second album, which was called The Unknown Celebrity. So I put that out there and I started traveling way more around the entire UK promoting it. And then I moved to London. I worked in London and elsewhere for three years. I was a management consultant. Um, That's how I met Susie's husband. Um, (laughs) And so, yeah, I worked there for three years. And then actually in... November 2011 is when I left in no, in 2011 I was just like okay by the end of this year I want to be a full-time musician so I set things up and positioned myself for that to happen and so I've now been self-employed for almost 10 years wow and in so from it's so for the from like to give a time frame so like 2011 to 2014 I was primarily doing the street hustle traveling to different cities and gigging and just selling my CDs out and about on the street, very literally. Um, And then from 2014 to 2018, my primary thing was doing pop-up shops. So I set up a pop-up shop with uh, one of my friends and fellow artists named Shouto, who's also an independent rapper. And we would go to different cities, London, Manchester, Derby, um, Newcastle, all over in shopping centers. And we'd be selling our CDs, our t-shirts. We had a headphone brand at the time as well, which we were promoting hoodies, et cetera. So that was kind of our main bread and butter. Then in early 2019, um, my business partner stepped away from that because he was working, he started working at a music college and I was hit a crossroads where I was like, okay, what's the next thing that I'm going to do? And early 20, early 2019 was actually a real big turning point for me because I was actually at a bit of a low point because I didn't know what the next thing was that I was going to do with my business and how I was going to reach more people because I didn't want to keep doing the pop-up shop indefinitely. It was hard to do as a one-man job, et cetera. So I'm there thinking, what can I do? And then that's actually when I had one of my tweets go hyper international viral. Um, So I posted a nine-second video, a deadlift video. People may have seen it or heard about it, where um, I broke the British women's deadlift record And I claimed I identified as a woman when it happened. And this thing went bananas. It went insane. I mean, I had 18,000 followers on Twitter when I posted it. As of today, I have 408,000. This thing thing just went insane. It went everywhere. Piers Morgan was talking about it. They were talking about it on Fox News in the USA. They were talking about it on Sky News in Australia, BBC. It went crazy. Millions and millions and millions of views from all over the world. So a lot of people discovered me. Okay. From that, And at this point, of course, I had my music. Um, I'd also started my podcast by then. So people came off of the deadlift video, but then they realized, oh, this guy's a rapper. Oh, he does this. He does that. Oh, he's yeah. actually really interesting. So that was kind of the, the gateway drug for a lot of people to end up discovering Zuby. And then that started this whole chain of dominoes where, um, you know, I released my book, Strong Advice, in the middle of 2019. Um, I spent three months out in the States. I got invited to go on a lot of really big podcasts. Uh, you know, Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro, um, Adam Carolla. I just got started getting all of these invitations and opportunities. So that continued to build my name, build my audience. And that momentum has just, you know, that, that initial tweet was more than two years ago now, but the, the, the momentum is, is still going and still rolling because I'm, offering a lot of stuff to people that, that they want and that they value. What, what inspired that tweet? <laughs> Just, it's, uh, it's, 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 so, <laughs> it's so brilliant, but so wonderfully, bizarrely brilliant. Like, I'm like, where did that come from? Okay. Uh, well, it, because it was an issue that, I mean, it's still an issue that people are still talking about now. I don't, honestly, I don't know how it's even a debate or a conversation, but it, it, it had been something I'd been keeping my eye on for several years. And I, like a lot of other people, was just like, oh, this is stupid. This is silly. This is going this way or whatever. And then that day, I'd seen two or three stories of that actually happening. 
right? I'd seen like multiple stories coming out of, um, you know, literally men identifying as women and beating women in their own sports. I'd seen multiple stories of this happening like that morning. And out of curiosity, I was like, hmm, I wonder what the, I wonder what the women's, like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good at deadlifting, right? I'm a strong guy. So I was like, I was like, I wonder what the women's deadlift record is. So I just Google searched it and I was like, oh, I can, I can smash that. And, <laughs> and I actually had a video on my phone from one of my previous training sessions where I was in fact lifting more than the British women's record. So I just put it out there. Like I, I put a lot of my thoughts and tweets. Yeah, out. yeah. Thought, okay, you know, it's probably, you know, it's yeah. like, I think it's funny. So other people will think it's funny. I did not know it was going to go out to dozens of millions <laughs> of people. Right? I just, it's, it's, gen it just, it's genius in its naivety, <laughs> to, to be fair. I just yeah. love that. I love that. It's just like, and not to mention, you know, bringing attention um, to what is actually quite a, a serious point at yes. the time and, and quite a, a serious debate mm. and and actually showing it for what it is which is as I think you've already pointed out completely ridiculous mm. um which is I why I think it's so brilliant in itself it's you're you're making the ridiculous really bloody ridiculous by yeah. sort of exposing it in that way yeah and humor is powerful oh right? 100%. Because, because it made people yeah. laugh it wasn't mm. like uh it wasn't like a, an angry response to the thing of like you know, this is why, you know, there's a lot yeah, of angry yeah. responses to that whole issue. Yeah. And I was kind of like, oh, okay. If those are the rules, let, yeah, me, exactly. let me use this to my advantage kind of thing. Right. So yeah. I, I just, I just did that. And I think having the video itself, a video can, can say, says a lot, right. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Like, you're just watching it and it's like, okay, this is what, well, this is why this thing's a bad idea. Cause look at this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I think I didn't realize how much of a, at the time I put it out there. Um, in fact, it's becoming a hotter topic again right now because I think the Olympics is coming up. But yeah. at the time, it was like a big global conversation. So mm -hmm. it didn't just reach people in the UK. It went to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, like everywhere. I started seeing people commenting in different languages and sharing it here and there and there. And I think also it just it just something I do a lot. I know you you, you mentioned you want to talk about authenticity, but I think something I do a lot, which people value is. I will say what other people are thinking Yeah, in the same way that comedians are funny because they often do that, right? You'll have a little thought about something or some issue or you've made an observation and you won't say anything for various reasons, but then a comedian will just come out and just say it. And it's hilarious because everyone in the crowd knows, okay, like I've been, I've been thinking that, right. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of that over this past year. We've had all these, uh, you know, restrictions and rules and, and, and a lot of them are, are illogical, right? They, they, they make no sense. I mean, I was just at a wedding two weeks ago and you weren't allowed to eat or drink standing up, right? Yeah. You know, or this thing, people go in a restaurant in the entrance way, they wear a mask and then like, you know, they sit down and they take it off and it, it, it's like theatrical, right? And you have this thing of like, okay, I think everyone knows that this, that some aspects of this are silly and are not making sense, but for various reasons, people don't want to say it, but I'm the kind of person who's just like, I don't really, I don't really care. Like I will just, say it <laughs> yeah. and so it resonates because everyone else is like yes you're saying what I want to say like you can say it for me kind yeah of. and they buy into you more because you're being real and true and you know honest and I, we've talked a lot about this on our on our podcast that mm. in the in the context of I suppose the workplace and, and in business but people see straight through that if if you're not being genuine and um you know demonstration of, of who you really are and I know you know authenticity is is so important to you. You know, your podcast is called Real Talk with Zuby or your music's on your own independent label. And I, and I know you decided to do that quite early on in terms of the music. Um, why was that important to you that you had that on your own kind of independent label? Yeah, to begin with, I, um, I don't like asking for permission. Like I don't need someone's permission to start a podcast or write a book or make an album, whatever it is, there are so many people out there who are creative or potentially creative, and they're sitting there waiting for someone else's approval, right? They're a singer, but they think that they need Simon Cowell's approval before they can release an album or make a single. They're a rapper, but they think they need some record label's permission to make music. It's like, no, you're a creative, make it, make it and put it out there. And in this day and age, 
I mean, even before, I mean, I, I, I was doing this back in 2006 and artists have been doing it from earlier. You can put it out there because it's really about the, it's about the fans. It's about the supporters. Even if you're looking at labels or radios or whatever, those are all middlemen. Those are all middlemen. You don't need all the middlemen. You can just create something and go direct. So that was a part of it. I also have, I'm, I don't, I wouldn't say I have issues with authority. Um, exactly. I have issues with authority that I don't see as um, valid, shall we say, right? If there's an authority that's like more knowledgeable than me in the area or like more experienced than me in the area, whatever, if it's just someone who's got this title, but they don't really know much about what I'm doing, then, then it doesn't matter. I care more about what my fans think, what my supporters think, et cetera. Yeah. And then from a creative perspective, there are advantages, right? You can create what you want to create as a musician, as a writer, as a podcaster, et cetera, you wouldn't want someone sitting over you saying, oh, no, you, you can't, you know, you, you, probably, you probably wouldn't want someone, oh, Zuby, no, you, you can't talk to Zuby on your podcast. Like, that's not allowed. Or you can't, no, you can't mention that. You can't say that, right? It's just like, and, and that happens in the music world, whether you're a band, you're a rapper, you're a singer, there are often people at labels who are just like, you, you'll make a song that you love. And they're like, no, you can't put that one on the album. Right. I'm like, what's the what's the point of being an artist if you can't even do that? And then also from a business and a financial perspective, you own it. You you own everything. I own my royalties. I own the rights to my music. I own every aspect of it. And even from a financial perspective, you are now earning. I mean, I don't know how much you know about the music world, but typically artists are on eight to 12% royalty rates. So say, I mean, this, this goes back, say back in the days where people used to go to HMV and, you know, buy CDs, people still do it, but less so now, or even from iTunes, if you buy an album for 10 pounds, at most, most artists are getting about a pound, mm. right? So they're getting, and that's assuming they've recouped. So you're spending 10 pounds or you're spending a hundred pounds and 10% of that is going to the person who actually made it, who wrote the songs, who put in all the effort, et cetera, which is yeah. just a bad business model. Like the music, yeah. the music industry has been, <laughs> this has been a bad business model for a long time. It's how you have artists who have sold millions and millions of records and they're broke. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that and I've observed that. And I'm just like, that is, that's crazy to me. So mm-hmm. actually as an independent artist, you can sell a fraction of the amount in terms of total numbers. Yeah. Um, still do really well. You know, I mean, if an independent artist were to sell 10,000 or, you know, 20,000 or even 50,000 copies of an album, that's serious money. Like that's serious, serious money. Whereas for them to earn that much in the old model or with a big label, they may have to sell literally four or 5 million copies of an album, which honestly, to be frank, no one, no one even does anymore. There was Mm -hmm. a time when people did used to do that, but that's not even really a thing anymore. So for various reasons, creative, business, financial, and sort of ideological slash philosophical, I've always liked the independent route. Same thing with my book, exact same thing, because the publishing model is pretty similar. I've spoken to publishers before and I'm, you know, there's a lot of them actually currently interested in working with me and, you know, I'm not interested in a 10% royalty rate. I'm currently earning a 98% royalty rate. So selling me on a 10% one is... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, makes it's, no it's, sense. It's a really. tough sell. You did yeah. the maths. Sell, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not and, a mathematician of any kind, but even I get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and also, last thing as well is it puts you in a much stronger position. Yeah. It puts you in a much stronger position for in a lot of different ways. I mean, bringing it into the modern era. And, you know, a lot of people right now talk about, you know, what people are referring to as cancel culture right? People are worried about getting canceled. You say the wrong thing and someone comes at you or this and you lose your job or whatever. And it essentially makes you more cancel proof, Mm. right? Because they can't just pull the rug out from under you. If someone can make you, someone can destroy you, right? Mm. If there's just someone there who's built you up, then they, they they can just take you down. They can drop you, whatever. So it's better for you to have that direct connection with your audience because then, like I said, again, there's, there's no one in the middle. There's no one controlling it. And, you know, you're not immune to absolutely everything, but you're in a, in a stronger position. Mm. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. And I think as well, 
you know, going into it with that initial, I'll call it control (laughs) over your own assets, but um, I suppose that responsibility of how you deploy those assets and how they're used and, um, you know, how they are uh, demonstrated and communicated out to the world is um, so, so crucial. And I think that when you're just starting out in business, you know, Lisa and I are um, been in business a couple of years now, but we're still pretty new oh. to this, um, this Com- world. Completely. I'm completely green. <laughs> Yeah. And so I think, you know, like you say, having that um, understanding of A, what's important to you and letting that build, be your kind of anchor in everything you do, but also then having that complete control as much as you possibly can on, mm. on how you then um, move forward and, and get that your work out into the world, um, I can see is is massively important. And I think as well, you know, you're a great advocate of, of just really being yourself and, and yes. being as authentic as you possibly can. Has it ever held you back in business? No, it's propelled okay. me forward, honestly. Um, have I lost opportunities from it? Probably, but I've probably gained 10 times as many. I'm sure that there are people who would not want to work with me because they don't like uh, some of my positions on certain things or they don't like whatever. Um which is a one-way thing, by the way. Like, I, I'm not someone who's like, oh, every, everyone I talk to or speak to or whatever, like, they all need to be 100% on the same page as me as everything, because that's that's insane and childish, um, and also not very realistic. So I think that's, um, I kind of think that's a plague in the creative world. There's there's far too much of that. Um, yeah. It's something I quite directly push back against. So uh, no, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it held it's held me back at all. And the truth is, leading on from what I was saying before. If you try to, number one, you can't be liked by everybody. No one. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Not everyone is going to like or appreciate what you're putting out there. They won't like the content or they just won't like you or they'll just be indifferent. You know, most Mm. most people are indifferent about most things, right? You don't listen to most musicians. You don't watch most movies. You don't read most books. Like you've got certain things you like. Everyone has certain things that they like and they consume, um, you know, food, right? But that's fine. You know, different people, different strokes for different folks, which is totally fine. So as a creator, as a business person, you, you recognize that, right? You don't try to cater to absolutely everybody and you don't, and you don't need to. And actually, if you try to, um, number one, it'll dilute your message or your product or your service for those who actually would really, really like it. And also, again, it puts you in a weaker position because, you can end up in a situation where you are at the mercy of your own audience or your own consumers. And I see this happening a lot. I see a lot of um, a lot of people where, number one, they grow to resent their own audience. Like that's a real thing. Like there are, mm. there are, there are brands and individuals and celebrities out there who don't actually like their own audience because they've, you know, gone with the wind and the trends so much that they've, you know, they're not being true to themselves, but then also they've kind of gained this following of people who are sitting there almost like waiting for them to say something that they don't like so that they can attack them or cancel them or mob them on social media or whatever it is. And I'm blessed to, I've I've very intentionally not done that. Like I quite intentionally, here's one of my secrets. I quite intentionally try to like offend everybody in my audience at some point, (laughs) right? To kind of like filter it out so that, you know, I've been unfollowed by tens of thousands of people on social media and it's like, oh, that's, that's fine. Right. Cause if, if I, if, okay, I said 99 things you agree with and then I said one that you don't, yeah. now you're going to unfollow me and no longer be a fan or whatever. I'm like, okay, good riddance, you know, cause I don't want that. I don't want it to get so, so narrow Mm. that, um, I can't do anything. It's also why I'm hesitant about labeling myself. I don't really like to label myself. People label me all the time. I'd, I'd really try not to. Um, I actually had an inter- I've had some interesting conversations with different people, even with. Um, so, for example, like, like I'm a Christian. OK. And I've had people be like, why do you not brand or market yourself as a Christian rapper or like a Christian hip hop artist? Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Number one is leading on from what I was just saying is it, it puts you in this box mm. where you're now 
at kind of at the mercy of your audience, right? Because if I do something or I say something which someone may not consider like Christian and proper, then suddenly I'm getting wrecked by my own audience, right? Because, you know, oh, I, I stepped out of this. It's also creatively limiting because then I feel like, okay, I can only make songs or content about this this one aspect of who I am or what I think. And I can't really, I'm kind of, you know, tying one hand behind my back because maybe I want to rap about something that, you know, isn't directly Christian or biblical or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just something in real life. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, okay, I'm, I can't really do that anymore. And then also um, it artificially limits your audience because there, my, my message isn't just for people who share my religious belief or even my political belief or, or whatever it is, right? It's, it's a message for, it's, it's much wider than that. So, and no, knowing the way that marketing and branding works, people quite rapidly determine if something is, is for them or not. Mm -hmm. And if you put a label on it, which they may have certain preconceptions about, or they may think, oh, well, I don't fit into that box. Then they're like, okay, well, that's not for me. Whereas actually, um, and which, which in, in that case, you, you, you've missed the opportunity for people to get that message. So I'm very open and honest about who I am and what I believe, whatever it is, agree, disagree, partly disagree, absolutely fine. You know, absolutely yeah. fine. Um, and anyone who listens to my music, I think they'll get like, okay, I get where, I get where this guy is coming from, but I don't want to shut that door before people have sort of even had a chance to discover it if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's an example, but that kind of goes, goes across a lot of different things. Yeah. Zuby, you have such a strong sense of self and your confidence is like totally incredible to, to be like witnessing and being a part of right now. Where, where does that come from? Cause I, I do think when we talk about this sense of being an entrepreneur, a lot of what holds people back from being the, an entrepreneurial and and going out on their own is themselves and it's that fear mm. of it's just about me and I can't do that because of you know what I tell myself and the the barriers I put up it requires confidence it requires a lot of belief in yourself and elsewhere which you mm. you know you literally just exude it so where does that come from I think it's a few different things um some aspect of it will just be my personality. Although I don't think as a child, anyone would have thought, okay, this guy's super hyper confident. So it's something that I've worked on and I view in a certain way, you know, the biggest human fear is fear of judgment from other people, right? Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. big, it's the, it's the biggest fear, you know, why doesn't someone want to start that YouTube channel or start that podcast or do, you know, more people are, the biggest fear is public speaking. More people are afraid of public speaking than they are of death. Mm. Right? It's called <laughs> it's called glossophobia, mm. um, and it's literally one of the biggest human fears. And it's fe it's not fear of speaking itself; it's fear of judgment from others. It's oh, I'm going to say something stupid, and people mm. are going to laugh at me. I'm going to trip when I walk on stage. I'm going to go blank. People are going to laugh at me. It's the same. Why are, people aren't afraid of making a YouTube video? Like mean, they're not afraid of their video recording and editing process. They're afraid that they're going to put it up there and they're going to get dislikes and people are going to write nasty comments and people are going to, you know, say bad stuff about them. It's, it's the greatest human fear and it's understandable because we're very social creatures. So part of my confidence comes from, I don't, and, and I don't mean this in the negative way, but not caring far less than the average person of what other people think of me. Like I care mm -hmm. about in terms of me personally, like I, I very much care about what people who know me think of me, my friends, my family, people who, who know me, right? Like I mm. care about that. Um, and also in terms of my work, my audience, right? The people who do, if someone who listens to most of my podcast episodes gives me some criticism or feedback on my podcast, that's way more valid than some random troll who never listens to my podcast and has just decided they don't like me and they're just cussing me out because they want to attack me, right? If someone listens yeah. to my music and is a listener, I value their feedback on my new album much more than the person who doesn't even listen to my music and has never bothered and they just want to attack me and tell me my music sucks because they're mad at life and they just see me there and want to target me. I told you, I mean, I've, I've sold over 20,000 CDs hand to hand. 
So to sell 20,000, 20, over 25,000, actually, you can imagine how many people said no. <laughs> you can imagine how many people ignored me. You can imagine, yeah. how, right? So when you've spoken to hundreds of thousands of people in the real world, let alone how many millions online, you, you develop a, th- a thick skin. You just get to a point where it's like, okay, well, um, I don't, there's nothing really someone can say that's going to penetrate through that armor. And also confidence just comes from being good at what you do. So as you get better, I'm not confident in everything. <laughs> I'm not confident in everything, but I, I know, I know what I'm good at. I know yeah. what I'm good at and I base what I do on what I'm good at. Yeah. And if I put something out there, people are generally seeing what I'm good at. Like I'm not confident with ice skating. I'm not confident. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not going to see you on Dancing on Ice. Oh, God no, damn right, it. Right, like, there, there, <laughs> there are certain things I'm, I'm, not, I'm not confident in at all. You know, if I had yeah. to step in an octagon with a, you know, a jujitsu ju- expert who wants to like, you know, s- submit me and make me tell, like, I'm not going to be confident. <laughs> I don't, I'm going I'm to get my butt handed to me. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a combination of all those things. Yeah. And, and what, what, when you talk about the, that experience of rejection, you know, again, that comes back to that fear point you've you've just been articulating in terms of the biggest fear many of us have is that judgment. Mm. And actually, you know, being rejected is really tough to deal with. And for many of us, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this for myself as well. Um, the ability and the motivation to pick yourself up and keep going, it can be really tough. And, mm. and, and I can imagine for many people, you know, when that happens, that, that's enough, you know, that's, that stops them. So what kept you going when you had those, you know, no's, if you like, in the street mm. with people who just didn't want to buy your music? I'll tell you what, at the end of every day, do you know what I remembered? I remembered how many CDs I sold. I don't remember how many people said no. Be like, hey, I sold 30 albums today. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't leave the day like, oh my gosh, 400 people said no to me. It was like, <laughs> I sold 30 albums. So every rejection brings you closer to success, very literally, right? I'd get to the stage where I would try to get 10 rejections in a row. Because if I got 10 rejections in a row, um, I was almost guaranteed to get a sale before I hit 10. Got yeah. So, so I'm like, okay, yeah. the more rejections I get, the more sales I get. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The more the more shots you take, the more goals you score. So that was it. And also, not to not to take it personally. Right. Not to take it personally. The, 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 the same with online as well. You know, you don't take it personally because, especially with online, because people who hate and people who troll, etc. It, it says nothing about you. It says everything about them. Um. Is, in your, I suppose, in your um business. As so far and, and building your brand and building your business over 15 years or so now reflecting back what's been one of your biggest learnings wow I've learned so much about people that's one thing I'm really grateful for I've spoken to I've met more people than most people would in several lifetimes already um, and the amount I've learned from that is quite indescribable because you you just learn how on, in so many aspects, in so many aspects, not just in terms of learning sales and marketing, but learning just how how people interact and how to deal with rejection, like you were saying, and how to frame things in a certain way. I mean, I'm very grateful for all those years of hustling on the street at the yeah. pop-up shop, et cetera, because that is experience that I have that almost nobody has. And it gives you, I mean, you were talking before about confidence. It gives you this like unshakable, just like super powerful mindset. Cause you've been through thousands of days, hundreds of thousands of interactions of just up and down and anger and sadness and rejection and success. And, you know, because because it, 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 the highs are so high and the lows are so low. Yeah, I could just go back to the corporate world and like <laughs> make good money and be stable. Instead, I'm here in Newcastle in the snow talking to strangers. <laughs> I live in Bournemouth. I'm in Newcastle, and like no one is even stopping to buy my stuff. And I'm like, what, like, Zuby? What the hell are you doing? Like, why? <laughs> um, but I can look back in hindsight now and be like, I'm glad I did that because yeah. it made me that much stronger. It's a hell of a roller coaster. 
it is it really is. I think having your own business is though and I think you articulated it wonderfully there which is it is the extremes of the highs and the lows they are they are both extreme in their own right it's, there's no middle ground with this and it's like actually I know what motivates me is how great the highs are and yeah. know that they will come again and I think that's what you're describing with the you know, I have 10 rejections, but it gets me closer to the win, which mm. I think, Susie, from our experience, yours much more so because your your background in sales in the corporate world is a lot larger than mine. Um, but that's what we would always be talking about, which is you have to expect that you're going to have 10 no's to get one yes. Yeah. I, I do a lot of gym analogies and it's the same. It's this, I, I, yeah. One reason I love the gym in training and strength training, it's not just to, you know, be jacked or to have big biceps or whatever. <laughs> Um, it's the, it's the mentality, Mm. right? It's the mentality. I mean, I remember when I couldn't do a single pull-up, right? I remember when I could bench press, like, I don't know, like a fraction of what I could or deadlift a fraction, whatever. And the reason I can, you know, do, I don't know, I think my best pull-ups is like 27 or 28 in a row. No more than Um, my none. Yeah. (laughs) But you know, like (laughs) get there, right? Before you can bench press, 140, you've got to do 130. Before you can do 130, you got to do 120. Before you can do that, you got to do 100. You got to do 90. You got to do 80. And so it's it's all progressive. It's like like learning a language. You know, if you yeah. work to learn a language, you start out anything. You start out, you're gonna suck to begin with, right? You're generally gonna suck, and you have to go through that pain and break through those barriers and obstacles to get good. Yeah. And a big thing I haven't actually talked about is um the the power of two things gratitude and perspective those are two things like all throughout my life every single day even multiple times a day i take a moment just to practice both of them mm-hmm. right to zoom out a little in terms of perspective and to understand okay we all personally have our struggles our challenges our difficulties whatever it is but we are so blessed in so many ways all of us are we're able-bodied we're healthy we're living in the uk in 2021 what we're doing right now is essentially witchcraft to our ancestors right we're in different <laughs> cities, miles hun- hundreds of miles away from each other real <laughs> time true. seeing each other right we've all got yeah. roofs we've got roofs over our heads we yeah. all have a source of income all of these things right we have great people around us we have friends we have family okay well what can what do i have to be grateful about and there's mm-hmm. so much, right? As soon as you start thinking about it, it's like, oh, wow, there's so much. Like, let me gain some, let me gain some perspective here because things could be infinitely, infinitely worse. Let me reframe it. What can I do to take advantage of this situation? You both started a podcast. Awesome, right? You know, I made an album, um, you know, and did a bunch of podcasts yeah. and this and that. So it's like, <laughs> okay, things are not ideal. Mm, it's not yeah. ideal, but it, it's happening and I can't control this aspect. So let me control what I can. You are a very inspiring individual and just talking to you, like I'm literally captivated by what you're saying and, and also in your business endeavors as well. I think the, how, you know, your business has so many different strands to it. It's very diverse. It's linked with a common purpose and, mm. and a common vision. Um, but, you know, that um, inspiration just kind of, oozes out of you uh in the way that you you communicate and and you talk and and approach things is there anybody who has really inspired you yes um my parents first of all okay my parents first of all i've got a got amazing parents um and my and my siblings to to begin with i'd always start with my family in terms of role models um outside of that i i like a man I have like my musical influences. Okay. Um, I'm a, everyone knows I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan. Um, I musically I'm inspired by tons of people. Um, you know, tech nine, Jay Z, uh, a lot of people that, that it's hard for me to list very specific people because I tend to kind of, I can be inspired by, I'm inspired by most people in a way, like anyone who is, Certainly anyone who's achieved a level of success in something, there are always parallels in what it's taken them to do that. And I think that if you frame your brain to be inspired by people rather than to jump to, I don't know, 
criticism of the things you don't like or the judgment or whatever, and you kind of are a bit selective, you can actually be inspired by virtually anybody, even people who you don't feel like you really like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we asked all our guests on um, the coaching cast for their um, hint, kind of three hints and tip, hits, hints and tips. Um, so if you were to give um, a little bit of advice or three hints and tips for anyone who's currently starting out in their own business or um, already perhaps are in business and are thinking about how they keep being their true authentic self uh, and, and um, you know, not losing that and making sure that they hold that dear to them in, in the way that they operate. Mm. What would, what would you say to them? Sure. Um, I would say the first thing is to keep in mind why, you're doing what you're doing. Um, uh, you, sh you should always know why you're doing it because you that'll help you to recenter yourself when you go off base or if you're not feeling motivated, right? If you remember, okay, this is why I'm doing this thing because everything can get tedious. You know, you can get yeah. 100, 100, out, 100 episodes into a podcast and you're like, wait, why am I, why am I even doing this, right? And then you remember why and it keeps you going saying, mm. you know, you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to do whatever. If you know why you're doing it, then that always helps. And I think that definitely applies to business. Um, second one. Second one, I think, is to have principles. Have principles and know things that you can be flexible on and, and the things you can't, the things you're not willing to compromise right um business negotiation friendships relationships all of that we always have to negotiate and compromise but there should be certain things where you're just like oh no i'm not i'm not going to do that right there are certain things where uh you know i've turned down a lot of money for from various offers of things i could do but i'm just like that just goes against my principles right if yeah. um Someone wants me to advertise a product on my podcast, which I don't, you know, I'm just like, no, actually I'm not, I'm just not comfortable for various reasons with advertising that thing. Like know the things that you are willing to, you know, you can compromise and negotiate and the things that you're just like, no, actually I, I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. Um, and then beyond that, I think just be, you know, be honest, be 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 honest and be be authentic just be a be a human you know like ultimately even if you're running a business or you have a brand you're still a you're still a person right and people yeah. people connect with people more than they connect with brands for the most part especially if you're talking you know smaller smaller businesses people people connect with people so you know you don't have to do the you don't have to be like super corporate all the time or talk like you're a robot or just have stuff. So I don't know, rigid and you, you don't have to do that. Maybe there was a time where you, you sort of did. Um, and I'm also saying, not saying, you know, you have to go to like the whole other extreme and have like no professionalism and just, start, <laughs> you know, just right. But, but just be, be, be yourself, be real. And, and that will naturally attract the, it'll naturally attract the right people as well. Cause if, if you have to fake like, like a friendship, right? Imagine a friendship or a relationship. If you have to literally pretend to be somebody who you're not yeah. for that person to like you or for that friendship to be sustained, then it's, it's not, it's not a real friendship. It's not a friend, good friendship. You shouldn't have to totally hide. Oh my gosh, I have to hide who I am for this person to like me. Cause that means that person doesn't, doesn't like you. And maybe like, you know, not everyone, as we said, not everyone has to like you. There will be people who do, who like you for who you are. So be who you are. And I say, let the chips fall, let the chips fall where they do um, mm -hmm. in the long term. In the long term, it'll work out better. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Zuby. Um, again, I've absolutely loved listening to you. Me too. Uh, fascinating your story um so far and I know you will go on to have even more success in the future with that confidence motivation and real inspiration uh to others so thank you so much for joining us on the coaching cast today you're very welcome yeah it's thank you Zuby. thank you yeah, it's been amazing 
coming to the end of today's episode where we've been speaking with Zubi about his entrepreneurial journey. Our tips from today for you to try are all from Zubi. So number one is keep in mind why you're doing this and use it as your anchor and your motivator. His second recommendation is have principles, what you will and you won't compromise. And his final tip is be honest and be human because people connect with people. In addition to the top tips from Zuby, we've also got some questions for you to try asking yourself this week. The first one is think about why you do what you do. What's important to you about it? Number two is consider your principles. What will you compromise and what will you not compromise? And the final question is, how can you be more of yourself in what you do? Think about the actions you can take to be your authentic self. We hope you enjoyed today and have some new ideas to take away and try for yourselves. If you have any questions, thoughts or feedback, we would love to hear from you. So please contact us at hello at thecoachingcast.co.uk or on Instagram at thecoachingcast. Your support means everything. Therefore, if you like what you've heard, then give us a follow on Instagram at thecoachingcast. Leave us a review on Apple and Google Podcasts. And most importantly, subscribe to future episodes wherever you listen. And also on YouTube by searching for The Coaching Cast. Our next episode is all about giving feedback and sharing recognition, something we know a lot of you would like to know more about. It's going to be a good one, that episode. I'm excited. Um, We both love music and use it to motivate and energize us. So we like to finish each episode with our personal song recommendation, giving you positivity and energy as you launch into your next Zoom or Teams meeting. It's my choice this week, and well, it has to be a Zuby song, and it is his recent single, Devil May Cry, so please go and take a listen. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and remember, you've got this.